Case number 22-3038, United States of America Appellant v. Joseph W. Fisher. Mr. Pierce for the appellants and, Ms. and Mr. Smith for the appellee. Good morning, Mr. Pierce. Whenever you're ready. Good morning, and may it please the Court, James Pierce for the United States. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. For their participation in the attack on the United States Capitol on January 6, 2021, the defendants were charged with, among other things, corruptly obstructing an official proceeding, namely the certification of the Electoral College vote. Congress in Section 1512C enacted two distinct and independent prohibitions, one for tampering with records and another, charged here, for otherwise impeding an official proceeding. Section 1512C2's plain text covers any corrupt conduct that obstructs or impedes an official proceeding, and the word otherwise indicates that the provision encompasses conduct other than the document destruction and evidence tampering in Section C1. Why doesn't it indicate offenses similar to the ones listed in C1, which is how the Supreme Court read otherwise in Begay? So, for various reasons, we list three in our brief. For otherwise is most natural meeting, and the one that one would consult and find in various dictionaries is another way, in a different way, not in sort of a different but fundamentally similar way, as Judge Bates characterized the reading that the district court below gave. But specifically, the reading that the Supreme Court or the majority in Begay gave to otherwise was looking at a very different provision than 1512C2, the residual clause of the Armed Career Criminal Act. Sorry. I mean, but before you get to the grammar and punctuation points, isn't that just the Begay's understanding is consistent with how language normally works? The example in the bar memo, but if we say slap, punch, kick, butt, or otherwise hurt, you know that hurt doesn't mean economic harms. So, two responses. One is looking at other statutes. So, for example, the federal kidnapping statute that says ransom, reward, or otherwise. The Supreme Court in Gooch in 1936 said actually otherwise in that context doesn't limit the sort of what follows to pecuniary benefits or something like ransom or reward. But I would grant that if you have sort of this long list of things at the end of which is something that just says and otherwise sort of similar to what the plurality and what Justice Alito did in Gates, you can or the court might appropriately apply something like the Iustum Generis or Nocia Torosokis and say we liken what follows this to what comes before it. But that's, again, not even just as a matter of grammar, but also as a matter of structure as well as purpose, what 1512C2 is doing. What you have there is a provision that sets out, you know, the document destruction, alter, delete, or not delete, but mutilate, conceal, et cetera. And then you have an entirely separate and distinct prohibition. And that's not only a matter, again, of the structure, but also the verbs and the objects. And this is something that I think Judge Moss in Montgomery points out. You're talking about sort of the effect on static objects in C1, whereas in C2 you're talking about changing the nature of the proceedings or changing a dynamic proceeding. And to give it this more limited reading, whether it's take some action with respect to a document, record, or other object as the district court construed it, or as I read my friends on the other side, not exactly to defend the district court, but sort of any act that affects. Impairing evidence. Right. Availability. Which, just to pause on that point for a moment, I think that also sort of highlights a core problem here, which is sort of the problem in Begay, which is, you know, you're just sort of going down a path where you're going to end up with no one really knowing what this means. If you stick with the plain text of the prohibition, you don't take that. I mean, each reading has its difficulty, but I'm not sure clarity cuts in your favor. I mean, impairing physical evidence is a pretty clear standard. It may be too narrow, but. Is there any textual basis for the impairing evidence? Well, no. 
there is there is no no textual basis uh, and the court the the district court i don't think points to a particular thing that that does that and, and if i could also just get back to, to judge katz's point I, I don't think our reading has uh clarity problems what i understood the district court below to say is well wait a minute you know interpreted in this way it's going to reach all sorts of things that is that that it shouldn't but there are other limitations in 1512 c2 that deal with that problem so a corruptly the nexus, um, and frankly, also the official proceeding point. I mean, one of the problems in- What's your I, definition of corruptly? So corruptly includes, but is not uh, fully intent to obstruct. And it also includes- What? Intent to obstruct. Okay, that's part of it. That is part of that's it. That's not all of it. Absolutely that's a, not. That's a necessary, but not sufficient element, right? Th that's correct. And in fact, in, in, in when we have, when courts, district courts have, have instructed on 1512 C2, they've actually put that outside of, of the corruptly piece, but I just want to make sure that, okay. that we think that's a required element that, that we must shoulder. Uh, it also includes acting either with independently corrupt or unlawful means or corrupt purpose. And when you say independently corrupt or unlawful, I know what unlawful means. What does independently corrupt mean? Well, I, I think there, and, and so, so that the court is clear, this standard comes from uh, the late Judge Silverman's separate opinion, separate writing in the North case. We understand. Well, I'm, I'm going to get to why we should pick yours in a second, but first I just want to understand what yours is. What it is. Right. So I, I think really the focus is on independently unlawful means. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, wrongful there could essentially take on the meaning as, as unlawful and the way, I'm sorry. Is there and then before you get to what I think you're going to say, which is unlawful means, or you're going to give some kind of a purpose element that could satisfy it. Here, were all the means, as alleged in the indictment, unlawful? So the the yes is, is, is the short hand, uh, and, and certainly the, the way the government would expect to prove this up at trial would to, be, would to point to uh, the trespass, the assault, the civil disorder as the means by which the defendants carried out their uh, obstruction of the congressional proceedings. And I misspoke a little bit. I, I meant independently unlawful, and that's how you answer. Th that's, that's correct, right? So okay, we wouldn't so just say I, the obstruction itself. And I, I think that knocks out cases like, or hypotheticals like standing up in a in a, a proceeding, uh, like the Bronstein case is an example we give in our, our brief, where someone goes in and stands up at the Supreme Court and sings and, and, and otherwise disrupts. Um, that's not a violation of C2. It's certainly obstructive conduct. And I, I'm interrupting you now, but I'm interrupting you now to make sure that you don't, that you're able to finish what's your full definition of corrupt. Right. So, so we talked about independently corrupt uh, means, corrupt purpose. Um, I think, frankly, on, on a case like this, we could prove this up without having to get to corrupt purpose. Um, but the kinds of things that that, that would encompass, one, Judge uh, Friedrich identified in the uh, Refit case, another of the, the January 6th related cases, uh, is someone intending to uh, perform an unlawful result or, or essentially intending to use unlawful means. So there she pointed to a defendant who said, um, we're going to stop this thing by dragging legislatures out by their uh, heads with their or by their heels with their heads hitting every step. What, ab what about an additional requirement? So you have to prove intent. You have to prove either independent unlawful means or some version of corrupt purpose. Let's put a pin in what un in otherwise corrupt purpose means, because it is pretty hard to define, probably not necessary here. You also have to prove, in order to satisfy the corruptly word, you also have to prove uh, a desire to obtain a financial or other benefit. So, no, I would say that is a necessary, excuse me, a sufficient but not necessary and, uh, piece. I would say that that could fall under the corrupt purpose. And no it's not necessary for the, if you're going to go the route of, independently unlawful means. That is correct. And that, what's your support for that? Is it is it just the Silverman concurrence? Uh, so, yes, I think that's the just Judge Silverman's concurrence, uh, partial dissent, partial concurrence in North, I think sets out it can be either or or both. Um, Why? And so now the question I previewed and then I'll get out of your way. I'll let my colleagues wait too. Let's say that I understand your definition of corruptly. And let's say that it is Judge Silverman's definition of corruptly in a non-binding opinion. Justice Scalia has an opinion, a, a, a definition of corruptly in some cases. Justice Thomas does. D Judge Friedrichs did, a, did a, a very thoughtful analysis of what it might mean here, as have 
you know, many, many other district judges in our court, I think maybe 20 of them have weighed in on this. Um, there, there's common law definitions of corruptly. Uh, why, why, why should we pick Judge Silver? I mean, so, he, if you're going to pick a judge, like he's, he's a great one to pick, but why should we pick his definition as opposed to a dozen other contenders? So let me just sort of clarify some, some things built into the court's question. 18 other judges on this court have uh, accepted the definition of, of corruptly um, that, that we have set out here. It was not Judge Friedrich, but Judge Moss in footnote five of his opinion said it, it can take on that meaning, but did not adopt it the meaning of, of improper benefit or advantage. And again, I'm not saying that that is not in a case a potential theory. I'm saying that it, under a corrupt purpose theory, that is what one could point to as a potentially corrupt purpose. So again, it would be sufficient, but not necessary. Answer, those, those. Why, why, like, I was going to try to answer your question more yeah, directly. Why, why, why is Judge Silverman's definition the best? So it's best because um, in cases like this that involve the obstruction of, of Congress, right? Um, this is a kind of definition that uh, focuses, uh, sort of recognizes that people can do things that uh, so th there is a, essentially like a lawful way to obstruct or to influence. And that, I think, is the problem that Judge Silberman is getting at and that the district or the 18 other district court judges that have uh, found our reading persuasive have also noted, which is uh, it is perfectly OK to try to let's take it in the January 6th context advocate that members of Congress not certify the election by objecting through the Electoral Count Act's you know, process. Uh, this, this definition, though, which focuses on you know, ind independently corrupt means, um, or, and I, and I can talk about the additional ways to get to, to purpose, it ensures that what they are doing is, in fact, corrupt or wrongful and places a, a limitation uh, on their conduct. So, I'm sorry, corrupt? Is it sufficient to prove either corrupt motive or corrupt means, or do you need both? Uh, I, I would I would I wouldn't call it motive. I, I would call it corrupt purpose. But but corrupt e purpose is e could be sufficient. Could be sufficient, and that's so. So uh, that's also consistent with take the the way that um, I see my my time no, is we'll up. Get, we'll give you yeah, great. Um, so uh, in fifteen fifteen subsection B. Congress defined corruptly, not for purposes of right. 1512, but for purposes of 1505. And to be just corrupt motive. Uh, right? I think the, the specific term is improper purpose. Uh, and then it says including things like giving false statements. So interestingly, so, it says. So purpose. why wouldn't why wouldn't that pick up um, the person who's sitting in the gallery and then just starts shouting during the proceedings? Uh, so. Separate question, right? I mean, that's 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 not the definition that we think applies to 1512 C2. Uh, we think that the the more demanding one that, that I'm sorry, give me your 1512 C2 definition. So um, corrupt purpose, which would require the intent to bring about something unlawful, uh, uh, influencing someone to violate a legal duty, or uh, as my as my colloquy with Judge Walker indicated, an attempt to gain some unlawful or improper benefit. So in the example of the person standing up in the, in the we'll, we will fully concede that that falls within the conduct as we see it, right? That is, you're, you're obstructing. But I don't see how that fits any of the three uh, corruptly definitions. You're not trying to bring about something unlawful. Maybe you're trying to stop the confirmation of some judge or, or whatever it is, or you know, advocate for or against the passage of some bill. That's not an unlawful result nor are you trying to ask someone to violate some legal duty, nor are you trying to secure an improper benefit or advantage for yourself or for someone else. So while that would fall within the, the conduct, sort of the scope of conduct of C2, it would get knocked out under corruptly. And, and again, that's maybe to circle back to where we started um, or, or the question about you know, the problems with our definition. Clarity is not a problem to the extent it is, as I took the district court below to, to be concerned with, the breadth of it, corruptly nexus, which we haven't spoken about, an official proceeding, build in those limitations to knock out I guess some I'm, of those cases. I'm, the person who shouts out you know, has no good faith belief that that's a proper means of stopping the proceeding, no good faith belief that the impending certification is going to be improper. They just, just want to disrupt. Why wouldn't that be improper 
you're resisting motive fairly improper purpose? Again, because I think there is a risk that if improper purpose is construed to pick up just kind of what's in someone's head to the extent of, I mean, you can imagine a hypothetical slightly tweak it. Say they are getting up there because the person who's up for confirmation, you know, they had a fight with 10 years ago. And so that's why, right? And so that's why I think giving some teeth to corrupt purpose as along the lines that I just laid out, if that's the route on which the government's theory proceeds, again, that's not the route in which I anticipate this case. And frankly, the vast majority of the January 6 related cases will proceed. They'll be on the corrupt means theory. But yeah, I do recognize that if corrupt purpose is watered down so as to sort of get in, you know, personal antipathy to whatever is happening, that could be problematic. But the point is, corruptly does place that limitation. Is the definition of corruptly really before us right now? That doesn't seem to be the basis of the appeal. It's not briefed that way. Judge Nichols, that wasn't what the parties were disputing before Judge Nichols from my reading. That's exactly correct. The definition of corruptly, some defendants have challenged it. In fact, the defendants here challenged it below. Judge Nichols didn't reach that. In his order denying reconsideration, in a footnote, I believe, Judge Nichols said, well, I think that the corruptly is too capacious to place a limitation. But this court certainly does not need to find corruptly to disagree with the plain text reading that we offer and that the district court rejected. And it's not something, I think it would be sufficient to say corruptly places a limitation on the nature of how broadly 1512C2 reaches to the extent we are concerned with the interpretive principle that criminal statutes are to be construed with limitations. I'm well beyond my time. If there are other questions. We probably have some more for you. Go ahead. You want to go first? Go ahead. Many judges have weighed in on the corruptly question. You're right. Judge Nichols didn't get to it here because he didn't have to. But most judges have had to. And we have a lot of district judges who have weighed in. I think we can weigh in if we get to it. You know, if we agree with you on official proceeding, if we agree with you about the breadth of C2, putting corruptly aside. Or we could say, you know, we're not going to decide this until Judge Nichols weighs in first. What would you prefer we do? I mean, I got one quick quibble as well. The official proceeding question, I think, is also not before this court. That the district court denied the defendant's ruling. But to the bottom line, you know, I think we would like this court to construe consistent with the plain language that there is not a conduct based limitation. I think it would be enough to say corruptly provides that, you know, a cabining. Let me let me rephrase it because I'm sure that if you're going to get a guarantee that we would rule for you, you would want us to rule for you. Of course. But, you know, in a moment right now when you don't know whether we're going to rule with you on the corruptly question or whether we're going to accept the arguments that the defendants have been making to district courts. Would you rather us answer that question now? If we rule for you on the other questions first. Or would you rather us rule for you on the other questions first and then remand to Judge Nichols to consider the corrupt? And why? How do we make that decision? I don't you know what? What should we be thinking about when we when we make that? So exercise that discretion. I think probably not decide it now is the better result and or is the is the better way of proceeding. Assuming, you know, you agree with us and you get to this question of do you does this court need to say more than corruptly as a restraining or constraining principle? And I think partially that's because a lot of judges have given this a lot of thought. It's come up through jury instructions. Right. This court doesn't have a jury instruction in front of it. I've got here some that I'm happy to quote to the court and I've kind of relayed some of those in answering the court's questions. But I think probably the better way for the court to decide that is on a record before it and deciding corruptly with respect to a jury instruction 
potentially a vagueness. We've had unconstitutional vaguenesses, vagueness challenges to corruptly as well. I mean, what pushes against that is, is as I'm sure this court is aware, um, we have many, you know, nearly 300 cases that charge 1512 C2. And so some degree of clarity is, of course, welcome in, uh, I think, for all the parties involved. But I think as a matter of, of sort of proceeding, I think probably waiting until the, the issue is more squarely defined uh, would be the proper way, the proper time for this court to weigh in. And there are a couple of cases that are currently uh, placed in abeyance pending this case um, where I think the court could decide it, I would hope, relatively expeditiously. You talked about this in your brief, but I want you to have a, I'd like to, you to talk about it more. Uh, the argument against you on C2 is that if you're right about C2, C1 is surplusage. Uh, maybe even a lot more than C1 is surplusage. Maybe some of, of uh, B is entirely surplusage. Um, if you're right about C2, can you just kind of speak to the surplusage issue? Sure. Even if it were correct that that C2 rendered um, much of, of 1512 surpluses, and I think it, at, at a minimum it carves out 15A1C, A2C, B3, and D2 through 4, none of which have any relationship to an official proceeding. Um, but, you know, surplusage uh, comes into play when, or the canon on, on surplusage comes into play when, so you're weighing no surplusage on one side and surplusage on the other. Um, I understand either the defendant's interpretation or, or the district courts below to also involve surplusage. Essentially, it would make uh, C1, which is the, the Gates plurality called a broad spoliation, evidence spoliation provision, C2 would, would essentially just uh, kind of be redundant as to C1. So I don't think, you know, to the extent the surplusage canon comes into play, it sort of is a net neutral. And of course, you know, as we quoted in our brief, um, overlap in criminal law is, is not unusual. There are plenty of cases that recognize that. And it's certainly not a reason to give uh, a sort of an artificial limiting construction when you've got plain language as we do here. O overlap is not unusual, but in other things equal, surplusage is bad and more surplusage is worse than less surplusage. So it's a perfectly fair point. No matter how you read this, there will be overlap, maybe substantial overlap, but your interpretation produces a lot more surplusage than the competing one from your friends on the other side. I think that's fair, but where the court started right there was all things equal. And we would strenuously reject the notion that all things are equal here. We think not only do we have a far more compelling plain text argument, um, but also to the extent one wants to look a little bit at, at legislative history, I think, yes, of course, in the post Enron era, there was a, a, a principal consideration on document treading. But at the same time, there were two other things that were going on there that I think are equally as important. One in 1512C, Congress was trying, and Judge Bates talks about this in McHugh, uh, sort of a direct obstruction provision. The rest of 1512, at least its substantive provisions, have this setup where essentially someone has to have affected person X for person X to then take some other action. 1512C you know, allows for direct obstruction. C1, again, perfectly understandable in the Enron context, focuses on documents and uh, evidence tampering. C2 says conduct other than that when directly targeting, thwarting an official proceeding. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, understood in, in that context, um, things, again, are not equal. I, I grant our, our reading has more surplusage, but again, not, not a reason to reject it. I mean, the Enron problem or fix is the difference between indirect obstruction and direct obstruction, right? You cause you cause someone else to shred the document. That's covered. If you shred the document yourself, that's not covered. That's the fix in C one. We agree. And if that's if if that's the motivating problem, I mean, I'm a little skeptical getting into any of this, to be frank. But if we do, um, it seems like your reading of C two does vastly more than fix the Enron loophole. So I, I think that's probably fair, but then that, that's sort of the second of the two points. And, and I will not resist the courts uh, saying legislative history probably doesn't offer much here. I mean, I think as, as we've recognized, or uh, you know, C2 is added relatively late in the game. Um, 
But uh, uh, sorry, so so um, I lost my, my my train of thought as to what. C there's a there's a mismatch. Oh, I, I, there's sorry. a mismatch between the most obvious problem before Congress and, on your view, what the solution is. Right. And, which and is I, this wholly new conception of obstruction divorced from any sense of evidence tampering. So um, I, I, I don't think it's wholly new insofar as Congress in 1982 had thought about a residual clause that, that sort of resembles what, what happened. And of course, uh, not something that we've talked about today, but in our brief in 1503A, you know, the, the omnibus clause in 1505, there were similar provisions that, that Congress, uh, you know, likely had in mind in drafting it. But to get to the point and the point that I forgot, which is um, the legislative history not only focuses, and again, we'll fully concede on the document shredding in the post Enron context, but even, uh, but it also talks about how 1512 is, quote, riddled with, with loopholes, right? And I think it is fair to understand, as Judge Moss and Judge Bates did in their opinions below McHugh and Montgomery, that it, it, it makes relatively little, little sense to say that Congress was focused only on that when they specifically legislate two distinct prohibitions. They've got, you know, not only 1512C1, but they also, of course, enacted 1519, which was at issue in Yates, and 1520, which is sort of an audit obstruction provision. Those are clearly all with Enron squarely in mind. Well, that doesn't account for what 1512C2 does. And when you're talking about this transition to direct obstruction, and you're also talking about a Congress that is concerned about uh, legislation riddled with loopholes, uh, we think that to the extent legislative history does, does some work there, uh, that pushes in our favor, or again, at at least at a minimum is a net neutral where we think our textual argument is, is the more compelling. What do you do with the um, elephants and mouse holes consideration with the placement of this new offense in C2? If Congress were concerned much more broadly, not not just direct, you know, do you do you tamper? Do you get someone else to tamper with the evidence, or do you do it yourself? But with other other forms of obstruction, unrelated to evidence tampering or witness tampering, right? That's sort of. Um, 1512 writ large. And if that's the concern, it just seems odd for the new offense addressing that to be buried in a subsection of a subsection. So uh, a couple of responses. First of all, 1512 uh, is, as the Yates plurality described it, full of, of broad prescriptions. Um, it is one of the sort of standard obstruction statutes uh, that, that, is, that is used and deployed along with 1503 and 1505. Uh, th this is responsive to the question of, are we talking about a mouse hole here? Right. I, I think a mouse hole might, might be some of the provisions at the beginning of chapter or the end of chapter 73. Um, and, you know, again, the Yates plurality described 1519 along those lines, one of these specialized, you know, uh, prohibitions towards the end of it. Um, and I think that's also, and, and this is in our brief, but I'll just make the point crisply, the, the way 1512 is structured, C2 sits at the end of the most serious provisions, right? That's exactly where you, you know, a reader would expect a kind of catch-all provision uh, to, uh, to sit, right? And so uh, that's not, uh, you know, unintuitively in the middle back or in the subsection of the subsection. That is directly where you would have something that captures, you know, for, for, a, for direct obstruction, things that are not otherwise uh, document destruction or and the, the last point on this you know 1512 doesn't just refer to witness tampering and to document destruction it, it also involves um and and this was prosecuted in another of the january 6 cases you know interfering with communications to, to law enforcement uh, and so in those you know in that respect 1512 maybe is an elephant already right and and so it's it's a perfectly natural place to put a catch-all provision well 15 i mean there Yeah, 1512 writ large is an elephant. I guess C2 seems, on your reading, seems like a very big deal relative to the rest of 1512. Um, I take your point. You know, it, it's at the right. You read it from beginning to end. It's a plausible 
account why it's after C1 and before B. It does seem odd that it's C2 rather than its own, its own section. Well, I mean, I, I don't think it's odd insofar as, again, Congress likely had in mind, and, and certainly the legislative history does bear out document treading foremost, but if you think- I mean, on your, on your reading, which is that otherwise does no work, and the words that follow otherwise just stand on their own, wholly unrelated to the examples listed in C1. So that's, I think that that's certainly how the district court character, characterized our reading. I don't think that's an apt characterization as, as many other judges, uh, district court judges in this, in this uh, district have recognized. I think Judge Contreras noted in, in Fitzsimons what otherwise does is it contrasts the prohibition in C1 from the prohibition in C2. Uh, as Judge uh, Moss said, it, it shifts the emphasis from the evidence foliation to attacks or you know, efforts to thwart, obviously to obstruct, impede, to influence the proceeding itself. Um, and so that is a, a tethering and, and it's not examples. I mean, examples is the Begay case or the Yates case. Uh, these are two independent prohibitions as Justice Scalia, similar to what Justice Scalia said in his concurrence in Aguilar. The last one I have for you is the titles. Again, not just positive, but a clue. And you've got um, not one title, but two. You have the pre-existing title of 1512, and then you have the title 11 title in Sarbanes-Oxley, which is corporate fraud accountability. And um, the offense, in the offense you're charging here, um, it's reprehensible conduct on many levels, but it's not corporate fraud. Fair enough, but the title of the actual uh, C2 itself, what became C2, was record. tampering with a record or otherwise impeding an official proceeding, right? Which just tees up the same question about otherwise in the text of 1512 C2. Maybe so, but it, but but you know, I think it, it nonetheless makes clear that these are, are two distinct prohibitions. And, uh, you know, you know, obviously the plurality in Yates looked at the title, and I think the title there was, was a pretty hard to say object was, was greater than a document record, etc. Um, but here, and I point to um, our filing in the district court at document 74 and the opinions that Judge Maida had in Caldwell and uh, Judge Moss in Montgomery sort of discussing Yates, including this, this title mismatch. Um, we don't think that does the work that it did say in Yates. Okay, Judge Walker. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We'll thank give you. you time on rebuttal. Okay, thank you. Good morning. May it please the court. Uh, Nick Smith for Appellees Fisher, Miller, and Lang. The offense in Section 1512 C2 is an evidence impairment crime. It's been an evidence impairment crime since Sarbanes Oxley was enacted in 2002. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble statute, hearing you. Excuse me. I'm having trouble hearing you. Yeah, Can you maybe it's the, the mic. mic. I apologize, Your Honor. Um, the offense in Section 1512 C2 is an evidence impairment crime. It's been an evidence impairment crime since Sarbanes Oxley was enacted in 2002. The statute, Section 1512. What's the textual basis for that? The textual basis, Your Honor, is that. Plain meaning is not derived by isolating individual words in a sentence, looking to the dictionary definitions, oftentimes tertiary definitions of the words, and deriving meaning. Meaning is derived from syntax, grammar, semantics. We have to look at the entire sentence. Subsection C2 is not a sentence, it's a fragment of a sentence. It's a dependent clause. When we read this sentence as a sentence, we have to give meaning to every word and phrase there. That's B gay. That's the B gay principle, but it's not limited to B gay. I'm, it's a I'm basic. Still, I'm still not seeing where in the text it's so, like evidence impairment. So, 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 um, so, Judge Pan, it's in the text because, as the B gay court held, we can't. If we were to give meaning to just the words obstruct, impede, and influence, and not read them in the context of the spoliation crime above, those words lose their meaning destroy documents because if every act, Your Honor, that obstructs a proceeding or influences a proceeding constitutes the offense, there is no sense given to the words in C1. There's no sense given to the word otherwise, they're bereft of meaning. So just as in Begay, when it was interpreting the ACCA clause in section 924, Judge Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg, excuse, excuse me, pointed out that if we were to interpret 924 EB, EB2 Romanet 2 in isolation, 
the words that are used in this, the Roman directly above that phrase would have no meaning because let, any let me risky violent you. crime would cover all of those offenses already. But if it's defined by C1, that's what Judge Nichols said, then that would be limited to documents, objects, things of that nature. But you're, you're seem to be advocating a different limitation, which is that it's evidence impairment. So, and, so, and, so. It, and if you're just relying on the words impeding, influence, et cetera, why isn't it just everything? Why, why, why would it be the evidence impairment versus the broad reading, which is what every other district judge has held and what apparently the other courts of appeals have held? Because even though those cases involved evidence impairment, those other courts of appeals have all very broadly interpreted this provision. Um, Your Honor, if we, we would encourage the court to look at the cases cited, by, including the courts of appeals cases cited by the government, because they all stand for the proposition that this is an evidence impairment crime. There has been no precedent since 1982 when the statute was None enacted. Of them say, that would I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think this is important. None of those cases say that it's an evidence impairment crime. They happen to involve facts that involve evidence but, impairment, but no, none of them say so. And they all say it's a very broad your, your Honor, it is correct that since 1982, um, no court has specifically addressed the question whether a crime in section in the statute 1512 is limited to evidence impairment. It's simply been assumed. It's been assumed because no one has ever argued before January 6 that this is anything other than an evidence impairment crime. Is your only evidence that it's been assumed is that it hasn't come up in a court hasn't ruled on it in any other context? Your Honor, I don't there, think that's a solid way. It's, of it's, your Honor, it's, it's, it's not an assumption because we can look at decades of protest at the Capitol and other uh, buildings around the United States where those events could have been characterized under the government's theory as obstruction of justice. But it's a category mistake, Your Honor, because acts of protest that don't involve investigations and evidence is not obstruction of justice. The title of Chapter 73 is obstruction of justice. The meaning of obstruction of justice is interference with investigations and evidence. And, Your Honor, I would point out the obstruction of Congress offense as it exists in Section 1505 and 1512. That is always involved interference with congressional inquiries or investigations alone. Those are the sole types of proceedings that have meant that have come up in the cases involving obstruction of congressional investigations since 1940, Your Honor. In 1940, as this court pointed out in Poindexter, the, the Congress created a special type of offense for obstruction of Congress. I don't it know was how much hived weight, I'm sorry. I don't know how much weight that carries when what we're dealing with here is a very different type of um, obstruction. The facts here are just not comparable to these prior um, instances that you're referring to. But let me ask you a different question. It seems to me that Judge Nichols was very clear in his ruling that he believes that subsection C2 is limited to um, instances related to documents, other objects, things of that nature. You're taking a different view. You think it's more general than that. It's evidence impairment. That's what C2 stands for. Are you defending Judge Nichols's um, holding? Of, of course, we're defending Judge Nichols' holding and we're taking it one step further. No, no, I'm just asking you, do you, do you think Judge Nichols ruled correctly and are you defending his ruling? Absolutely, he ruled correctly. We're only- Then, then why, why are you then offering a different theory? So, Your Honor, we're not offering a different theory. If Your Honor lets me explain, there are a couple of appeals court decisions that the government is citing where subsection C2 has extended to types of evidence impairment and availability interference that don't involve documents and records such as suborning perjury okay. or, or, or encouraging individuals yes. to, to give false testimony in front of the grand jury. We Judge, are, Judge we, Nichols said that those were wrong. Yes, and so, Your Honor, what we are doing is we are applying the principle in BGAY that every word and phrase in a statute, in a sentence, has to be given meaning. And how does that apply in this context? Well, what Justice Ginsburg said was that the crime in the general provision of the statute has to be similar in kind and degree of obstruction, in this case, to the types of specific crimes. Similar in kind, Your Honor. So if we look at the kind of offense that's in subsection C1, it's an evidence impairment offense. And an, an attempt to influence uh, um, the testimony in a judicial proceeding is the type of evidence impairment offense. It's similar in kind oh. and it's similar in degree of obstruction posed, Your Honor, well, because they both affect then, the type of evidence that would be in a proceeding, unlike thank protests. You. Which, Excuse me, counsel, when I start speaking, you need to stop. Thank you, Your Honor. So 
since you are you relying on Begay, is that your primary case that you're relying on? Your Honor, I think it's accurate to say that we're relying on it and a canon of construction that was used in Begay, which is to give effect to every purpose and uh, every word and phrase right. in the statute. So can you explain the structure of the statute at issue in Begay as compared to the one here and why it's appropriate to rely on Begay when in Begay it was a list of things mm -hmm. and a catch-all phrase, whereas here we're in two different subsections separated by a semicolon and an or. Your Honor, we understand, we appreciate the government is making that argument, but if you were to, um, if we turn to the Begay decision itself, you can see that Justice Ginsburg interprets section 924 EB2 Romanet 2 in light of the words in EB2 Romanet 1, which is separated by a line break and a semicolon. So even in that case, Your Honor, I think the, I think I have the exact quote here for you from the court. Quote: This is from Begay. If Congress meant Clause Romanet Two to include all risky crimes, why would it have included Clause Romanet One? End quote. That's 553 U.S. at 142. Um, in that case, uh, the Supreme Court was holding that it is appropriate to apply the Eustem Generis concept of Nostra Associus when the phrases at issue are separated by a line break and a semicolon. Um, so, Your Honor, after January 6th, there was a category of nonviolent cases. So can I ask, just following up on the distinction between Judge Nichols' theory and yours, so let's assume we accept your invitation to try to read the statute consistent with how Begay understood otherwise. So we have the list of enumerated items, then we have the word otherwise, then we have very general language, which we have to limit to pick up the criterion of similarity among the enumerated items. Well, you might say, and Judge Nichols said, the obvious, the most obvious criterion of similarity, if you look at C1, is at physical evidence spoliation. So why do we jump up a level of generality to say, well, it really the criterion that matters is just evidence spoliation. C1 is much more specific. Um, Your Honor, I think it's defensible, as I just indicated to Judge Pan, to rule as Judge Nichols did, to, to find that the quote, in kind, refers to documentary evidence rather than the kind being evidence writ large. Um, but I think, Your Honor, we're, we're giving it to the government that there are, I think, at least three courts of appeals that have interpreted C2 to extend to non-documentary types of evidence. And we would agree that it would it could be appropriate to interpret the kind at issue to mean mm -hmm. evidence, because that's how it, in fact, has been interpreted by various courts. Um, but yeah, I mean, sure. But then seems like you're taking a less you're you're urging a less textually obvious loss in order to avoid a lot of bad precedent for you your, your honor i think what it comes down to is the purpose of, of is what happened in arthur anderson and the purpose of the sarbanes oxley statute in adding subsection uh, c um, I take my colleague's point about the distinction between direct obstruction and indirect obstruction. The problem for the Arthur Anderson prosecutors was they had in Section 1503 an omnibus obstruction crime. But that section doesn't apply when the proceeding is not pending. That was the case in Arthur Anderson. The judicial proceeding was the, the grand jury proceeding was not then pending when documents are shredded. However, they had subsection 1512. That applies to scenarios where the proceeding is not pending. However, at the time before subsection C was added, it only covered indirect obstruction. So it seems fairly clear from the context, from the statutory history, that subsection C was added to create the type of evidence impairment defense that is available in 1503 um, and extending it to section 1512. Um, we don't need to reach stray comments about documents shredding and the like and get that, ver get that specific. That is the Arthur Anderson loophole. That is what's being closed by subsection C. I think we, we didn't hear from our colleague any explanation for why the Arthur Anderson loophole would have something to do with actions unrelated to evidence. Unrelated to evidence. Arthur Anderson had nothing to do with 
actions like protests that don't relate to evidence. And that's why this statute has never been used for that purpose. So what the, what the government is doing here is it's asking the court to look at isolated words in a sentence, look at the dictionary definition, and ignore the entire context of the statute. And your honors, we would just, I think we would quote Justice Kavanaugh recently. He said, quote, the meaning of a sentence may be more than that of the separate words, as a melody is more than the notes. That's a dissent in Basta. He's quoting Judge Hand. The problem that he was identifying there is if we look at one word and we don't look at its use, its context, the people that interpret those words normally, we're not doing justice to the meaning of its statute. If you look at melody, that's a fair point, but usually the melody for a, a eustem generis type argument is you have a list of nouns or verbs which are very specific, and then you have a very general catch-all phrase at the end of the list, right? Well, Your Honor, we, we here, have that here, but it, it goes to Ms. Judge Pan's point about the line break and the semicolon. But if we, again, if we go no, back... No, but hey, let, let me yeah. finish. I'm not making the grammar or punctuation point. Um, what's unusual here is that C1, it's not just a list. It has its own internal structure and coherence, right? You have a list of verbs, you have a list of direct objects, and you have a mens rea requirement embedded in all of it. And same to some extent with C2, you have a list of verbs and you have a direct object and the direct object in C2 fits the verbs in C2 and the direct objects in C1 fit the verbs in C1. It seems more like e each one is more likely to stand on its own just, you know, when you play the melody of C1 and then play the melody of C2. Well, if we could shift back from the, the, the music metaphor to grammar, uh, we would just point the court to the distinction between the, the omnibus clause in section 1503 which Justice Scalia analyzes in Aguilar, um, and the what the government is calling the omnibus clause in C2 in Section 1512. The, a true omnibus clause is an ind, is a sentence. It's not a sentence fragment. Section 1503, which the courts call an omnibus clause, is a complete sentence. But subsection C2 is a fragment. It's not read in isolation because its meaning is derived from the entire sentence. So, Your Honor, I think even though there were verbs that are different in subsection C2, the, the entire subsection se section C is a sentence, unlike other omnibus clauses. Um, and so, Your Honor, I, I think we, we have to point out here that the, the injustice of kind of this interpretation, I think that's important to look at. The injustice. The injustice of this interpretation. And here's how it plays out. If we give the government this interpretation, Your Honors, may, may I continue? Yes. Um, it collapses the distinction between a misdemeanor offense that has been used for decades at the Capitol for protest called the Title of 40 offense called parading and demonstrating in the Capitol. The intent, the criminal intent there is to demonstrate in Congress. Under the government's reading, there's no distinction. There's no conceptual distinction between that class B misdemeanor, and a 20-year penalty felony. The government has never explained to any of the trial court judges isn't that, that... Isn't that where the corruptly um, definition comes in, so, according so, to the government? So, so according to the government, that's where it comes in, Your Honor. But one one element that my, my colleague left out here is that in every jury instruction for 1512 in the district courts, in the trials that have gone on this charge, wrongful purpose, wrongful and evil purpose are included. Um, I think you heard they, uh, are Ms. Included. And they are always included, Your Honor. So I think you heard Mr. Pierce say, well, I think the focus here for corruptly is unlawful means. That's the focus, he said. But wrongful purpose has been included in, ev I believe, in as, every or virtually every jury as, as, su as sufficient to establish. As sufficient as one among many. And so, so, Judge Pan, this gets to your question because you were just pointing out correctly, well, that's a different element. Corruptly is not in the Title 40 parading offense. But if it's defined to mean acting with any wrongful purpose, then compare the two crimes. One person goes in the building with the intent to demonstrate and 
and the capital. Another person goes in with the intent to influence the proceeding of the capital with a wrongful purpose. So then so we're getting if, if, if corruptly, though, is the distinguishing feature here. Don't we need to wait for a case that raises corruptly to decide this? We can't decide the corruptly thing because you're telling us it's unfair in order to influence our statutory construction. In this th thank you, Judge, for that. And I, I meant to get to this. So we need to interpret corruptly in this case because the government's brief itself is arguing that the limiting function that your honor was just seizing on depends on the definition of corruptly. It is arguing that we don't have the collapsing Title 40 problem and the construction problem precisely because of its definition of corruptly. Well, let but, me ask you Judge Walker's question then. If, if this case turns on corruptly, is this something that we should remand to Judge Nichols or do we need supplemental briefing? Because I don't think this case has been teed up as turning on corruptly and we don't have briefing on that. I don't you, think it would be correct for us to decide you, this without briefing. Your Honor, we're always happy to do well, I will never answer no to the, the request for supplemental briefing, but I think the court has sufficient briefing here. We've cited the Reeves decision and Justice Scalia's concurrence and dissent in Aguilar where the judges are drawing a distinction between two types of proceedings. There are judicial proceedings where actions that interfere with an investigation or evidence are corrupt and wrongful per se. Um, judge, the, the court in Reeves, the Fifth Circuit decision said, in that context, courts have eliminated the unlawful benefit element only because it is corrupt per se, if you're not a lawyer, to start interfering with evidence and uh, the investigation of a, of a proceeding. But outside that context, as this court found in Poindexter and North, the congressional proceeding context involves a wild variety of interactions. This court said in North, people try to interfere with congressional proceedings all of the time. In that context, any wrongful purpose is unconstitutionally vague. We've cited Poindexter, that's in, 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 the, in the briefing. We've cited Reeves, we've cited Justice Scalia's concurrence and dissent in Aguilar, and we believe that's sufficient. The court, the government has never explained why this distinction between judicial proceedings where wrongful purpose is okay and congressional proceedings is acceptable. It, why those two proceedings can just be merged. The courts have always found that they can't be merged, Your Honor. Okay, I so, understand your position on that. And, can, can I ask you a different question? It seems that the gateway to get to all of this analysis is ambiguity, right? In order for us to- Could you say the, that one more time? The gateway to get to all of this analysis is ambiguity. We would have to find the words of the statute ambiguous in order for us to go down all of this analysis that we've been discussing. So I'd like to know what your best <laughs> argument is for why the words of the statute are ambiguous. Your Honor, we don't think they're ambiguous. We think that the um, the reason that this statute's never been extended beyond evidence impairment and availability is because the, the notion would have been crazy before this context to extend it beyond it. But, you know, at the very least, Your Honor, extending C2 beyond the realm of evidence when there's no statutory history supporting it, no precedent I'm supporting sorry, it. I'm sorry, but the words of the statute I'm, I'm talking about the words of the statute. The words of the statute are quite clear and they're broad. So How, why is that ambiguous? So it would be ambiguous if we were to interpret C2 in isolation and say that that's not a sentence, that subsection C is not a sentence, and that C2 should be ice, can be read as a sentence fragment on its own. If we were to do that, it, it's, it would, it's read in conjunction with C1. C1 has a list of things and and otherwise here are some other and anything else that obstructs or impedes. It would be ambiguous. Qualifies. So why is that ambiguous? It would be ambiguous, Your Honor, because if we're outside the lane of evidence and investigations, we're floating in space, Your Honor. So let's take the example of congressional. But the words are not ambiguous. Do you agree the words are not ambiguous? No, they, they're very general words, Your Honor. If we, so they're what I'm general saying, but not ambiguous so, words. So a famous linguist once said, meaning is use. The, we, the meaning of a word is its use in the language. So if we just look at the words themselves, yes, um, they are ambiguous, Your Honor, because that's why I'm asking you why. Because, because okay, here's why: because context is important. If we're inside the traditional lane of investigations and evidence, those words have specific meaning. Justice Scalia explained what those words mean in the Aguilar. But Your Honor, if but where we, in the I, text I just, are we inside the lane of traditional? So, 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 so Your Honor, I, I'm just I'm just trying to complete this one thought, and then I think I think it's answering Your Honor's question. If we if if we take congressional inquiries and investigations, which is the classic use of obstruction of Congress defense, if we set that aside. 
we're in a world where any type of proceeding in Congress is obstructible under the obstruction of justice laws. So the actions that are criminal are not as specified. They're vaguer. If there's a, for example, Your Honor, if there's a proceeding. Go back to corruptly again. Well, so, I, so, so okay. no, it, it's actually the actus rei. So if we're in a proceeding, let's say, assume Congress, if you'll allow me one hypothetical, Your Honor, let's assume there's a congressional investigation, such as the select committee that's investigating the attack on January 6th, and they're issuing subpoenas to individuals. As a defendant, if you see that there's a congressional investigation, the types of actions that are obstructive and influencing and impeding are within a conceptual lane. It's an investigation. Well, this so you goes can't to destroy- proceeding then. There's also a definition of proceeding, and there's no dispute that this was a, a proceeding. Well, well, statute. So it, it, well, I'm just going to answer the court's proceeding question, but then just finish this one sentence about the lane I'm referring to with the vagueness of obstruct, impede, and influence. If we're in the context of an investigation, the types of those words take on specific meaning because they're well-defined in the case law. But if we're outside of that lane of investigations and evidence, any type, we're not clear what type of act it is that's the actus reus. Let's say there's a markup proceeding. One of the trial court judges said that now proceeding under the, the obstruction laws in Chapter 73, can it, it can extend to markups at Congress. Well, then you're criminalizing essentially the business of lobbying and interest groups in Washington, D.C. Why? Because if an individual were to approach a senator or a congressman and try to influence legislation, I think we're back a, to jur- a jury of 12 could determine that is an obstructive or influencing act. And if there's a wrongful purpose, that's criminal. But the- let, let me move to a different topic, because if it were the case that your construction is correct, the government says that the conduct here alleged, the facts alleged, could fall within the definition that you're proposing, because there was um, an attempt to to stop the, I guess, the examination of of documents. I guess that's Judge Nichols's is view about which you're also defending. You, you think that Judge Nichols's view is correct. Judge Nichols says objects, documents, things of that nature, right. if you obstruct, impede those types of things, then that would fall within the statute. The government is saying that they were stopping and obstructing the examination of certifications in this case. And so it falls within the definition that you're proposing. So, so it wouldn't fall within the definition we're proposing, Your Honor, because ev- because an investigation is involved when Congress follows certain protocols to I- initiate an inquiry or investigation. And in, in, this, in this court's decision- I'm sorry, in- but the- <laughs> Now I feel like you're questioning proceeding, which is not before us. Everybody agrees that this was a proceeding, but now you're trying to limit it, limit the statute to investigations. Well, well, Your Honor, we, we would push back a little bit on the point that the, the definition of proceeding is not before the court, because again, the principle is that the court has to give ev- meaning, give effect to every word and phrase in the statute. So when we're when we're interpreting the phrase obstruct, impede, or influence an official proceeding, the court is necessarily having to examine. Counsel, the, I, forgive me. I just find it a little frustrating because I feel like it's whack-a-mole. I try to home in on one aspect of the statute, and then you answer me about a different aspect. No of the more statute. moles, Your Honor. So thank you. So can we just stick right now yeah. to the government's mm-hmm. assertion that if we interpret the statute the way Judge Nichols did, which you are defending, that it would. It would apply to the facts of this case because there was this other means of impeding the examination of certificates, which are documents. So, so your honor, document the uh, certificates and, and ballots that we've pointed out are not is not evidence because evidence is a, is a material that proves the f- truth or falsity of a proposition. A ballot is registered. No, right now, we're opinion. sticking with Judge Nichols's interpretation. You, Judge you, Nichols says he doesn't say evidence impairment. He says documents objects, things of that nature. You say you're defending Judge Nichols's interpretation. Right, right, the right. government says that this conduct falls within Judge Nichols's interpretation. It's, it's, That's your, what I'm asking you about. Your you Honor, I think stick with that. Y- yes. Well, Your Honor, we are we're sticking with that. We're just only making clear that we are taking the legal position that ballots do not constitute evidence. That's the only that's the only point we're making. So when Judge Nichols holds that. As a matter of law, outside the context of January 6th, the, the crime in subjects in C2 is a type of spoliation crime. We don't read Judge Nichols to be saying, I equate uh, electoral count ballots with evidence. We don't. Does Judge Nichols' holding require equation with evidence? Because he, he says that those evidence impairment cases are wrongly decided. He said this is strictly a textual reading that limits it to the things in C1, which so, is 
documents and, and other things of that nature. So, so, so Your Honor, I, I, I think I'm answering the question when I say that we, we, are, we are defending Judge Nichols' decision and we are acknowledging that Judge Nichols limits subsection C to two types of document impairment and that that would imply that the government could supersede and allege that the defendants had interfered with documents they have not done yet, Your Honor. That's not in the record. So we would say that the government has not alleged at this point that these appellees have interfered with documents on January 6th or had that intent to. So you agree then that as a legal matter, that factual, those factual allegations would make out an offense under Judge Nichols' reading and the government could supersede their indictment? Your, Your Honor, we don't think Judge Nichols reached the question of whether uh, the ballots that were used on January 6th are uh, the types of documents that are be, that he is contemplating in, in subsection C2, we don't think that's in the record right now, but we're only making clear that our position is that ballots are not evidence. And if Your Honor would let me elaborate on that point. I know, but if, your if, ballots are not evidence argument goes to your theory, not just Nick's theory. And, 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 and yes, Your Honor, and, and if we were to extend the obstruction of justice laws into the context of ballot counting, the implications are vast and very volatile, Your Honor. So consider one example. In 2000, we had a contested election where one of the presidential candidates sent members of his team to encourage the stop, to encourage individuals counting votes to stop counting votes because of hanging chads in the state of Florida. Uh, there was not just litigation, but there were teams of, of operatives working for these teams encouraging people to stop counting votes because under their interpretation of the law, that was improper. Hanging chads should or should not have been counted. Under the government's theory, it, you could classify the, the candidate, the Democratic presidential candidate's actions as obstruction of an official proceeding. Because under Section 5012, no well, 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 Your Honor, if again, if corruptly is defined to mean any wrongful purpose or any unlawful means, if we determine in retrospect that, well, maybe these hanging chads should have been counted, that was unlawful to stop the, the vote count with these chads. That could be considered an unlawful means. But I guess if, if this seems like a fanciful hypothetical, it does. That is because, Your Honor, obstruction of justice laws have never extended into the realm of vote counting. There Mr. are Mr. Mr. Smith, Smith. Sorry. just on this. Suppose um, there were an allegation that a, a January 6th defendant broke into Congress and actually found the certified votes and destroyed them. Would that be covered by C2 on your theory? Um, Your Honor, it wouldn't be under our theory because, uh, again, the obstruction of Congress offense entails legislative inquiries and investigations, and it has since 1940. But if we were to stipulate that point and say we can extend this crime outside of investigations, um, then I mean, and it seems closer to the classic destruction of evidence case than to the case of the guy who's in the gallery and starts shouting. Your Honor, we would say that's probably also destruction of federal property. And again, um, so if we were to stipulate that we're an investigation, we're not. But if we were to stipulate that's evidence and we're not, we would agree that that is more classically the type of obstruction of justice crime than is alleged in this case. Um, but but so we, the, the issue here is that the government is not without remedies for every hypothetical we can come up with in every January 6th context. For assault, we have assault. For interference with police officers, we have interference with police officers. For trespass, trespass. For parading in Congress, we have that as well. The crime they've created, and it is created because there's no support in the case law for it before this to extend it outside of evidence and investigations, the crime they've created is sitting parasitically on every other crime they've alleged. It's not adding unique content to a crime. It is merely turbocharging the sentencing guidelines for that offense. So if this court were to hold that this is an evidence impairment crime, there is virtually no effect on the classic types of meat and potato crimes, so to speak, that they're covering with all these other offenses. It is sitting on top of every single one of them and adding no content, Your Honors. But I, I think if, if the court will allow me, there's one point I'd like to make about the ramifications of this holding. It extends well beyond January 6th. If we were to just consider historical acts of protest at the Capitol that we consider that we celebrate so, today. Mr. Smith, you, you have made this 
point at least three times. Yeah. Of, you know, if we do this, then it's going to encompass protest. One of your clients said it was war, period. This was no protest, period. Right? It, absolutely, Your Honor. So we're not talking about a protest, right? Well, well, we, we would push back on the notion that one person determines whether what protest is, you know, without looking well, at the answer, objective facts. And, put the quote aside. Was this a protest or was this something more? Your Honor, when you take it as a whole, absolutely not. Absolutely running in, not what? At, at, Running into the Capitol, assaulting police officers, uh, conspiring to stop the vote count, those are all not acts of protest. However, Your Honor, and none of that happened in the Florida recount. None, none of that. The teams of lawyers that were sent None today. of that happened in the Florida recount. But, you, but Your Honor, but there's one you more wrinkle. You used the word injustice earlier. Yeah. I, and I, I, do, I do take some umbrage at the notion that maybe you have a strong textual argument. Maybe if we use a justum generis and oscator associates and we're worried about a surplusage canon, and we look to the title. I get, I get all, and I, I think this is. Uh, there are parts of this case that are close, but you seem to have made a theme today of saying it would be kind of an injustice, uh, a gross imbalancing of the equities, to treat your clients the way courts and prosecutors treat lawful protesters for whom no prosecution should be brought, and even unlawful but peaceful protesters. And so, I mean, we could go through the list. I, I, I won't belabor it too much more, but the, the teams of lawyers that went down to Florida that you analogized to January 6th rioters today, they didn't say, quote, civil war should start. They didn't use a grappling hook and a rope with a level three vest and a helmet and a mouth guard and a bump cap like one of your clients did. They didn't say a Democratic Congress should be taking the gallows like one of your clients did. They didn't say we should have a mob trial. They didn't punch, kick, punch officers using a bat and stolen rice. I mean, can go on and on and on. I think you would have to concede that this has nothing to do with the protester outside the Capitol with a sign or with the lawyer who goes down to Florida to try to enforce Florida law and federal law and ensure a fair election. Right. It's a, your Honor, it's an excellent point, and I would just like to to explain what I meant in response to that. So when I refer to injustice, there's two kinds, maybe you might say. There's injustice relating to the facts in the case, what happened in the criminal case, and then there's justice in what we're doing, which is considering how the laws apply. And the injustice I'm referring to is the principle that like is considered like like. So when we have hundreds of people who have done this very bad thing, and they're running inside, and they're they're parading misdemeaning, parading in uh, uh, you know, demonstrating in, in the Capitol. And we have hundreds of people who do the exact same thing. And the government is saying they all have the same purpose. It's to protest the 2020 election. When like is not treated like like. But you're we, not comparing like and like. That's right, correct? You just conceded. The, the analogies you've given of litigation in Florida in oh, 2000 oh, are not oh, like this. Oh, Your Honor, I was going to get to the Florida example at one point, but I was just, when I refer to injustice, I didn't reference Florida. I was merely referring to the scenario where one person does the exact same thing. Mr. Brown and Mr. Black do the exact same thing, and they have the same intent. When the justice system doesn't treat them the same way, that is an injustice itself. And, so and, I, and I, we can I'm stipulate with you, that. I'm with you on that, but why yeah. isn't this... First of all, I'm not sure what that has to do with statutory interpretation and textualism, but even putting that aside, why isn't the solution to level up, prosecute the next group that well, does what happened here? Hopefully it'll never happen. Again. Well, Your Honor, I think this that's when we would go back to the textual argument and say it wouldn't be appropriate to level up because the, the issue here is the offense has always existed. It's parading and demonstrating in Congress. Unfortunately, Congress in its wisdom has deemed that a class B misdemeanor. So when we so, so, so sorry. the, the suggestion is I'm when sorry, we're trying to counsel is, yeah. isn't what you're referring to just an exercise of prosecutorial discretion? No, Your Honor, because in the, we have scenarios where the, it is stipulated that the conduct is we can see the conduct is exactly identical. Walking into the Capitol, the purpose is the same. That is, the, you know, the corrupt, the intent, the purpose, the wrongful purpose is protesting the 2020 election. You don't think this was unprecedented? It, absolutely unprecedented, Your Honor. Well, There's been no be surprising that. There's no precedent for a prosecution. So, so it's unprecedented in the scale and the horror of the event. Absolutely. 
But it's not unprecedented in terms of the actus reus that we're trying to define in the statute. There have been countless examples when hundreds of people have rushed inside Congress going back to the 1970s. There's a classic case called Jeanette Rankin Brigade, where this court considered a march of 5,000 people. Counsel, I'm just trying to prevent you from going far afield here. My point is simply that there were a lot of people there that day, and there was a panoply of of behavior that occurred. And um, we have hundreds of these cases. And before I was elevated to the D.C. Circuit, I sat in the district court and I had those cases before me. They're all different. And so isn't that where prosecutorial discretion comes in to determine the gravity of the conduct of each individual, determine which charges are appropriate to charge? There's a felony offense, which is enumerated here in C2, and there's a misdemeanor offense, mm-hmm. which is the parading, mm-hmm. demonstrating offense. And prosecutors look at the conduct of each individual and exercise their discretion, depending on the gravity of their conduct, to determine which to charge. Why is that unusual? That is commonplace. Your Honor, prosecutorial discretion is absolutely not unusual. I was making a slightly different point that when it's agreed that the actus reus and the intent are the same, there might be different factors that distinguish the cases in terms of their severity. Right, of which the makes conduct. it felony conduct instead of misdemeanor but, 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 Your Honor, we are nevertheless, we are still in a world where the same actus reus and intent are both at the same time a class B felony and a, t- a class B misdemeanor and a 20 year felony. That is not a normal situation, Your Honor, as Your Honor knows. I can't think of another example where the- I'll give you an example. There are, there's a case of felon in possession. You can prosecute that in DC Superior Court or you can prosecute it here in federal court. And there are vastly different um, sentences that are meted out depending on which court you're prosecuted in. That's prosecutorial discretion. But, but, so, but Your Honor, when we- It's we're, the exact same conduct. Your, Your Honor was pointing out that we need to pull this back to congressional intent. So the, the reason we're bringing up the Title 40 offense is to ask, did Congress intend when it's had this long-standing statute of parading and demonstrating to Congress, did it intend for C2 to cover acts of protest unrelated to evidence and investigations? Then we're back well, to Judge fact- Walker's point. This is unprecedented. Well, what happened here is unprecedented. But, but, and Congress used broad language that on its plain face encompasses this conduct. We, we, we take the court's point of that, and I just wanted to respond to, to Judge Walker's point about the, the protest and violence, because this is absolutely essential in this case. It is unequivocally true that there were countless attacks of violence and despicable conduct, interference with police, and for all of those individuals, they are not protesting, and there's no argument otherwise. In NAACP versus Claiborne, the Supreme Court case, the court was clear that an act, this case involved acts of protest that also engaged violence at the exact same time. And the court was addressed with what Justice Stevens called the chameleon-like issue of conspiracy in the context of, of protest and violence. And the court said that one does not m- lose one's right to protest in a public forum like the Capitol grounds simply because others around them are engaged in protest. There was a defendant, Charles Evers, a president of the NAACP, who was heard uh, saying that folks might have their necks broken at this next boycott. Um, the court found that, that that was actually still protected speech, even though there were individuals breaking necks uh, or destroying property around them. So I think the point that we would just make that is that the protest question depends on the defendant. Um, and here, for acts that do that, that Judge Walker, for acts that are the kind of conduct that's despicable, there is a statute that reaches every single one of those. This obstruction of justice statute is not reaching any of that conduct. It's just sitting on top of everything else. So thank you. No. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal, Mr. Pierce. I have a handful of points, but of course, happy to answer any, any uh, residual questions. Uh, the first one I want to start with is one that uh, came up, which is sort of the mismatch between uh, the defendant's proposed interpretation uh, and the district courts. And uh, I think at a very core level, that illustrates the, the, the problem with looking outside of the plain text. The plain text does not have this kind of limitation in it. Um, there are safeguards so that uh, it does not read as, uh, as expansively as my friend on the other side suggests. We talked about some of those before, and I'm happy and will try to address them here. But at the end of the day, when the text says this is for corruptly obstructing, impeding, influencing, 
an official proceeding, which is defined as a proceeding before the Congress. Uh, and again, that's a point that the district court has decided below. It is not up for whether it has to involve investigation or inquiry, which is, by the way, precisely what Congress has already uh, prohibited in Section 1505. Um, that is the way that this court should interpret it, consistent with its plain language, not toggling between interpretations that I think could, could well result in the kind of ambiguity uh, that we saw in the ACCA and ultimately led to its constitutional invalidation. Now, if this court were nonetheless going to adopt a, a, an alternative construction, we do think that we could satisfy that. Um, but we also think that it's probably that it would be appropriate to uh, interpret it somewhat broader than what Judge Nichols said. At a minimum, it should also reach um, any conduct that prevents or thwarts the consideration of documents uh, or objects at a at an official proceeding that would be consistent with the sort of the document and object nexus that Judge Nichols uh, read into sections 1512 C2. Um, and that would also clearly encompass the conduct here. And it would also give C2 uh, independent meaning. I'll pause for, for a moment. I don't know this to be true for, for sure, but I suppose one reason to, to uh, defendants seem to resist this notion about taking some object uh, taking some action with respect to a document record or other object um, is not only could that capture the defendant's conduct insofar as it involved um, uh, tackling or, or excuse me, uh, impeding the consideration of the electoral certificates, but at least one of the defendants, Defendant Lang, picked up a baseball bat and started swinging it at officers. Um, that certainly seems like taking respect, taking uh, action with respect to an object uh, that uh, led to the, uh, you know, obstructing the, the consideration of, of the documents and, and obstructing, more importantly, the certification vote. Um, so we don't think the court should go down that path, but that alternative argument, we, we, that alternative construction should be broader. Uh, and then just very finally on, on corruptly, I think this came, came out again. But one clarification is I heard my friend on the other side to suggest that, um, uh, you know, wrongful purpose uh, is, uh, you know, uh, we're resting just on, on, on wrongful purpose or that, that the, the courts have, uh, in some contexts, have said that's um, not sufficient. What Justice Scalia in Aguilar discussed and what uh, some, some courts have talked about, I think Judge Silverman as well, has said intent to obstruct in this kind of context is not enough sufficient. Some courts have said intent to obstruct in the judicial context would be because it is impossible or, or nigh impossible to imagine how someone could intend to obstruct a judicial proceeding and have anything other than a corrupt. So I'm purpose. sorry, your, your friend made a factual assertion that in many of these cases, the jurors are being instructed that corrupt intent is sufficient. You disagree with that? So it, it is it is corrupt, uh, it was sort of wrongful or unlawful purpose, purpose. either independently corrupt means or corrupt uh, or, or unlawful, and sometimes some judges have said unlawful purpose alone, some have said unlawful or wrongful purpose. That's fully consistent with the way courts have read in not only the judicial obstruction context, but in the congressional obstruction context. The you, problem arises, I'm sorry. Do you, do you know of any precedent where a court has said, this checks the corruptly box? You know, there's a statute that uses the word corruptly. This, this checks that box where the means were independently unlawful, but there was no intent to obtain an undue advantage for the defendant or or someone the defendant wanted to obtain an undue advantage. I think it's a difficult question to answer because when juries aren't aren't asked to make that determination, I mean. I suppose that let's take these cases, not these specific ones, but the January 6th cases. It is possible to make an argument to say defendants wanted to secure for themselves the improper or unlawful advantage of having their preferred candidate right, no, I get that. prevail. I mean, that's not a, that's not well briefed and, and uh, Correct. you know, uh, maybe we would go there. Maybe we would not go there. I'm just wondering if any other court has accepted a definition of corruptly that finds independently unlawful means to be sufficient, absent a purpose of obtaining an unlawful advantage for the defendant or someone else. So I, I can offer an answer to the second part of the question, but not as, as much the first by saying the following. Many, many courts, uh, court, courts of appeal, some of which discussed uh, when my friend on the other side was up here, have defined corruptly without 
reference to the improper benefits uh, standard. In fact, I'm not aware of any court uh, of appeals or district court that has applied the improper benefit to 1512 C2, the statute at issue here. Uh, and, and, and many of those convictions did involve uh, defendants engaging in other independently unlawful means, sometimes reflected in other charges in the indictment. Um, so I think that is that's a, a yes. Uh, but with the caveat that the improper benefit, again, wasn't charged, wasn't something considered by those courts. So one could post hoc come in and say, we can construct a narrative to say that one could also say there was an improper benefit, but that wasn't neither charged in the instructions nor, nor uh, a holding of the Court of Appeals. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, the case is submitted.